All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are in strawberry season, as you know, and uh, uh, we are, I just wanted to share with you some of our trials here in over the last five years. Let's see. And it looks like, am I still connected? Yep, you're still good. good. Okay, good, good. Just had, had a little bit of a flash there. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, we had uh, five years worth of evaluations here. Uh, just wanted to sh share with you some of the, the trials that uh, we've conducted, some of the results that we've gotten from our trials. And so, um, you know, as many of you know, strawberries are a probably second to peaches, probably one of the most important fruit crops in the state. And uh, let's see, we can. So we've seen a rise in demand uh, in uh, both nationally and within the state, uh, but but they're they're in Alabama. This has not really translated into a lot of acreage, but um, uh, more there has been an increase. There's been an increase in the number of operations that grow uh, strawberries, although the acreage has has um, has decreased. But this is a, a a common trend. We're seeing smaller operations more but smaller operations um, in the state. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, strawberry uh, consumption is growing. Uh, not only is the consumption growing, but um, uh, the more, not only are more people uh, consuming strawberries, but more households are uh, consuming strawberries. So, um, and then we're also starting to see more innovations, more uh, production innovations uh, like uh, we're, uh, pr precision agriculture, protective horticulture, uh, where a lot of these strawberries are coming on the inside. We're putting them um, put putting, um, using greenhouses or high tunnels, some sort of protective culture uh, to ensure the, the crop. And um, variety selection is probably the most important decision that a grower um, will make. Um, it, uh, because uh, uh, selecting the wrong variety can be disastrous. Uh, it is just that important. But um, most uh, in variety selection is the most sustainable means to solve production problems, most practical means to solve production problems, uh, be they uh, insect pests or disease pests, also some um, uh, weather-related issues such as uh, cold or drought or heat. Uh, Variety selection is the most important uh, and most sustainable means to uh, begin to address these issues. A variety selection is going to be vital to the success of meeting production goals. Uh, be you in the north or in south Alabama, there are some varieties that uh, would do well in the north, but maybe quite not in the south. Uh, so variety selections uh, or variety trials will um, help uh, help growers to make the, the best uh, selections possible for their operations. And so the objective of, this, of these trials has been to select varieties that are the best adapted for Alabama. And uh, first of all, let's start with the different types of strawberries before we go into the strawberry varieties. But we have short day types or spring bearing. Um, these form flowers. Um, uh, not necessarily the flowers, but the flower initials or the, the, the makings of flowers are formed in response to the sh uh, shortening of day length. So as the day length gets shorter, you begin to form, you, the plant begins to develop these, these initials, the like flower initials that um, when springtime comes and we've got warm temperatures and uh, warm sunny days, these um, flowers will then bloom. Uh, next is the, are the long day, uh, strawberries or the everbearing. Uh, these are in response to these form flowers develop in response to longer days. So uh, these are all photoperiod dependent, both of these. Uh, day neutrals, on the other hand, are not photoperiod dependent. And so it, it, they're not affected by day length. Now, the, these are um, these aren't necessarily that rigid of categories. The current research now is starting to discover that uh, there's a little bit more fluidity between these things, um, uh, some of these designations. Like some 
day neutrals or facultative day neutrals, and they, they can uh, perform uh, similar to uh, short day varieties. So, uh, but uh, these are uh, the, the ones that are we're used to dealing with, and uh, for the most part, short day, and uh, also some day neutral flowers that are day neutral plants that we deal with. And regardless of the, uh, the type of berry, flowering will shut down when temperatures get too warm. Uh, so we start getting the temperatures up, upwards of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, you begin to see um, the flowers and then begin to shut down. And I wanted to point out, uh, which, before I talk about the different uh, uh, production systems that we use, we have uh, the matted row production system and the annual hill plastic culture system. I wanted to talk about the uh, the way the a little bit of the anatomy of the strawberry plant, and as you can see, this long sort of extension here. This is for uh, all of you who may not be that familiar with strawberries, but this is these are called runners or stolons, and at the ends of these stolons or runners, uh, we have the daughter plant. So we have right there in the center, uh, we have the the mother plant at the at the base. She sends out these stolons that then produce daughter plants. And uh, that's important for the matted row system. As we can see, uh, the matted row system, um, you, what you have initially is you have, uh, you have your mother plants planted. And as time goes on, um, the plants, the, um, the rows will then begin to fill in with the daughter plants. And this is the driving force behind the, the matted row system. Uh, matted row system uh, now is not really used that much, except maybe for homeowners. Uh, this is not the commercial, not the system of choice for commercial production. Uh, this is a, a semi-permanent system. Uh, you can get years as long as five to six years out of this planting because uh, strawberries are a perennial plant. Uh, but the, the, the production of daughter plants will drive this system. So it just keeps renewing this, the, uh, the planting um, with new daughter plants that then go on to produce fruit as well. And that leads us to the annual hill plastic culture system. And just as its name uh, implies, it is an annual system. Uh, this uh, typically uh, in the weeks prior to the uh, October, uh, we get the, the ground prepared and the plastic mulch laid and the plants are planted hopefully by the 1st of October in central Alabama. And these plants will then go, um, they will overwinter and they will produce, they will be in harvest in early spring. And then at the end, all of this starts all over again. This whole operation is ripped up and, and reapplied. So we have the annual hill plastic culture system. This system is actually more, um, uh, more productive than the matted row system. And all of the varieties that we have are adapted to the, uh, the, the annual hill plastic culture system. So for varieties that we've used, um, we've, we've started out with about 20 varieties over the five-year period. And I've identified five of them that um, have, done, have been somewhat productive um, compared to the market standard Camarosa, as you can see here. Uh, we have uh, Albion, which is a day neutral variety, uh, followed by Camarosa, which is the, the, the market standard, Camino Real, Chandler, and Ruby June. Um, uh, those last four varieties are short day varieties. And uh, Chandler, at one point, I should point out that Chandler was the market standard at one time, but Camarosa um, outperformed Chandler over the years, so it was replaced by uh, Camarosa. And what we used in our trials and what um, all of the growers use in our area are, is the annual hill plastic culture system. This is a rows that are covered in uh, polyethylene mulch, black polyethylene mulch. Um, and these, these, are, these are actually beds. These are raised beds uh, for effective drainage of water. And on top of those beds, you can see here a, a mechanized uh, uh, hole puncher in, in the plastic mulch. You can also have a system um, where you have uh, two seats attached right behind this hole puncher, and you can have uh, uh, 
uh, two uh, riders, two field crew members uh, riding in tandem, planning uh, one uh, crew member planning in one row and the other planning in the other, because we have a double staggered row on top of these planting beds. And we have a within row spacing of 14 inches and between row spacing of 15 inches, which gives us about uh, 1200 plants per acre. Uh, we use plug plants. We uh, There are some operations that use the uh, the bare root plants. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Uh, the bare root plants. These are a little bit more, a little bit harder to manage, harder to plant, a little more sensitive. Uh, the bare root plants are plants that, uh, not bare root, but the plug plants are a little more forgiving. So if you're, a, especially if you're a novice and you're planting these, uh, this is probably the, probably the way to go um, with uh, the plug plants. And some of the things that we'll be looking at are plant size, um, number of runners or stolons. Uh, we'll get into the some of the important attributes like uh, uh, berry sweetness and acid contents. Uh, also, the, the health promoting qualities such as antioxidants, uh, which is one of the leading uh, cause reasons why uh, consumers are purchasing strawberries. They're purchasing, uh, purchasing them not simply because they taste great, but also because they have these health promoting um, compounds like antioxidants, these anti-cancer uh, compounds in plants. And we are looking at one in particular, and that will be anthocyanin, one in particular, one uh, antioxidant in particular. And then we'll also look at yield, of course, and uh, cull fruit weight and berry size. So beginning with plant size, we're looking at Camino Real. Uh, it's a, it actually produces a pretty compact plant uh, along with just a little bit smaller than the Albion plant. Uh, it, uh, with that, then it would allow uh, closer spacing um, so you can get more plants per acre. But a number of growers uh, like the, the fact that there is some space between the plants. There's more space between the plants. Uh, one, uh, for better uh, pesticide coverage, but also because uh, if you have a pick your own operation where the, your clientele goes in and they harvest their own, uh, if you have a big plant like a Camarosa, then you have a better chance of those berries being missed. And those, berry, those missed berries will, will rot eventually, and they'll just serve as sort of a, uh, a, a, a source of inoculum for other diseases. And so it, it becomes a management issue um, sometimes with these larger plants. So on to runners. Now runners management can be an issue because these have to be removed or, or should be removed um, when, you're, when they're being produced in the field because it will stimulate better or more uh, plant production. Uh, the runner production is as a signal that the plants are becoming more vegetative and you'll get less flowering. And so in 2020, I have two, two years where I've measured this. And in, in 2020, um, you can see we, with Ruby June, it had quite uh, significantly lower than the rest. So we essentially have one, uh, less than one uh, runner per plant with Ruby June. Um, with Chandler, of course, had the highest. Uh, we took the readings a little earlier in 2021. So they're all pretty low and they're all, they were all less than one plant uh, one runner per plant, uh, but uh, Ruby June again was uh, was exceptionally low. So if you have a back to our our uh, example of the matted row, if you had a matted row system that is uh, dependent on the daughter plants, then Ruby June may not be the variety that you want because it doesn't really produce a lot of um, of uh, daughter plants. So on to berry sweetness. Uh, the way that we measure berry sweetness is through the measure of soluble solids. This is sort of a, a, in, an indirect way to measure the sweetness and the units are called percent bricks. It's named after a researcher who, um, uh, who identified this. And so uh, with when you're dealing with bricks, any measure that is 10% and above is really considered sweet. Uh, but in strawberries, we see that we, we tend to, to be under 10 here, um, but that we still have that great strawberry flavor typically uh, with, with uh, most varieties. Uh, we can see that um, Chandler uh, was, was, uh, was higher along with Camarosa, the two, well, Camarosa was the market standard, but uh, 
is still pretty sweet. Uh, Ruby June and also Camino Real. Camino Real was the lowest. I wasn't really surprised by that because Camino Real is, is known for uh, not being that sweet. But uh, it, uh, and it had to be used this year. Camino Real was uh, used by some growers who don't ordinarily use it, uh, who don't ordinarily grow it. And uh, their clientele loved it. And they, they said that the taste, the flavor, the sweetness uh, was perfect. And, but uh, in the past though, Camino Real has been known to um, not be not that sweet. And it is recommended that if you're gonna grow Camino Real to uh, harvest them when they're dark red. And that seems to be the best stage. Uh, acid content, uh, that's another, uh, attri that's another uh, attribute of, of flavor. And so the sweetness, acid content, and what you want is you want a lower uh, acid content and a higher sugar content. Uh, that sugar acid ratio is important in determining um, uh, maturity and, and quality. Um, you can see that uh, Camino Real did have the, the lowest, although uh, there's really basically not a lot of difference in acid content across the varieties. So next we come to um, the health uh, the health promoting compounds like antioxidants. And in this case, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about anthocyanin content. And uh, one of the interesting things that we noticed was that uh, Albion and Ruby June, and I'll just say that these two, uh, uh, the five, uh, had the best flavor. Uh, and it's interesting that these two had the lowest in the, um, the health promoting compounds. So I'm not, not sure if there's any, anything there, but it, it could be, there could be something. But antioxidants, uh, which are, tend to be the, uh, the plant pigments, along with the, uh, the, along with the acids and the sugars, all of those uh, play together um, to form the, the characteristic strawberry flavor. So now, finally, we're in yield. Uh, I've looked at both early and total marketable yield, and I've included them both here on the same slide. Uh, the early marketable is in the green, and the scale uh, to follow is on the right, uh, on the right axis. And the gray is the total marketable yield. That's the uh, total uh, yield for the season. And that's, um, of course, on the left. And we can see the Camarosa. This is a five-year average. You see Camarosa is still the number one in terms of marketable yield, both in the early season and in the total season, followed by Camino Real and Ruby June. Uh, Camino Real, uh, I think that it could really be a replacement for Camino Real if you um, do not have a, uh, if you, for some reason you cannot get Camarosa, uh, Camino Real um, could be a good substitute. Ruby June, oh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but the yields tend to be a little bit lower, but it is a high quality berry. Uh, Chandler, again, we can see is the mark, was the market standard, but it was quite a bit, uh, lower when we compare it to, to especially to Camarosa. Next, uh, we move on to the cull. Now, cull fruit management can be an issue. That's just more fruit that you have to pick out, and that's more fruit that's not being, uh, that's not being sold. And most of the cull fruit, I, this example here looks, this, these two fruit, two strawberry fruit afflicted with anthracnose, but most of the fruit that we deal with in our trials for the culls have just really been very small. Uh, they just didn't really have the, the size necessary to be a marketable, uh, marketable uh, fruit. And those are uh, fruit that are 12 grams and below. And how do we know if a berry is 12 grams? Well, uh, what we do is we, uh, we measure, we weigh a berry that's about 12 grams. And then, and throughout the trial, we will then um, sort of eyeball it and anything that's low, less than that in size, then um, we know that that is not a marketable berry. And Chandler had the highest, uh, Ruby June had among the lowest. Camarosa, even though it is, it's among the highest cull producers, it's also one of the higher uh, yielders. 
And that brings us to individual berry weight. And we haven't really seen a lot of differences, but uh, we do know we do see that Chandler uh, was quite a bit lower in individual berry weight compared to some of the others. And Albion and Ruby June, uh, though not the top producers, especially Albion, uh, those uh, tended to have the largest berries um, in the group. Okay, and so this brings us, I'll talk individually on these varieties individually, give you a little bit more information. Uh, we've got Camarosa, it's a, again, that it was the market standard and it was the breeder is UC Davis in California. Most of our varieties, it seems like the, the varieties that were the, the most productive, the most successful have come from uh, Georgia, uh, a, a California breeding program. Uh, it has a good flavor, and uh, high marketable yields, and again, as a, a large plant. And as I mentioned, this could be a, an issue. Um, large plants can be an issue. As opposed to Camino Real, uh, it has smaller plants and maybe uh, for better or easier management. It is another California variety, a short day variety. And I have here uh, percent Camarosa in yield. So um, the first number is 86% Camarosa yield, that's in our trials. The second number is 76% um, of a Camarosa yield. And that's what we've seen in uh, on-farm studies. So what, what um, people are actually getting in their farms. So uh, Camino Real is it's, uh, somewhat uh, similar to uh, Camarosa. That brings us to Ruby June. Um, this variety, when it first came out, uh, people either loved it or hated it, but it is it's really growing in, um, in popularity. It's from Lassen Canyon, another California variety, short day, excellent flavor. Uh, the, the only drawback is that it's just not, uh, doesn't really yield as much as Camarosa or Camino Real for that matter. Uh, it has a 76% um, uh, Camarosa yield compared to a 70 uh, well, 75 compared to 76 on farm. So they're, they're, they're pretty much even. What we were finding in our research plots was similar to what people were finding out in the, in the field. And berry size uh, was a little bit higher out there in, in the on-farm studies. That brings us to Albion. It's another California variety, and it's the only day neutral variety in our, in our study. Uh, uh, I haven't really been too uh, particularly that impressed with it in terms of yield. It does have a good uh, eating quality though. And uh, wanted to mention uh, Fronteras, it is the variety to watch. It, it, it last year, it uh, did a tremendous job. Uh, has 106% of a Camarosa yield and it produces a very large berry at 27 grams. But we need more data um, before we make any type of recommendations for this variety. But so far, it's doing pretty well. So, in conclusion, Ruby June, Camino Real um, were the, the, the two, were the top two varieties. Um, again, I'm not really sure. I really don't uh, think Albion is, is suited for field production uh, in this uh, region. Um, it, possibly, it could do pretty well in a protective culture. Um, but in our systems, it uh, hasn't uh, done th that well. And uh, Camino Real can serve as a uh, replacement for Camarosa. So some pointers for variety selection. Uh, you wanna uh, choose a small planting area. You don't wanna jump into one variety um, that, that for which you don't really know uh, how it performs. Um, and you know, your, your selection will depend on your market. Some, um, some clientele can tell if you're not growing their particular variety. Um, also, you wanna plant, you wanna extend your season as much as you can. So a lot of growers will plant an early variety uh, to get to the market sooner. And also, you wanna be sure to select the variety that is suited for your production system. We have some uh, disease packages. Some varieties come with disease packages. Um, uh, and there are some with anthracnose, uh, all the crown rot anthracnose and the fruit rot, fruit uh, anthracnose crown rot or anthracnose fruit rot. Um, 
there are some varieties out there that do have some resistance or tolerance to that. Uh, powdery mildew, now some of these others uh, are, um, there are some varying degrees of, of tolerance or, um, or, uh, or tolerance or um, resistance to these varieties. Now there's a new variety out there called Neopestilatiopsis or Pestilotia. Uh, it's been a pretty devastating disease so far. Uh, it's been found in Florida and in Georgia. And most recently there's uh, one uh, location in Alabama that uh, has, um, we've that tested positive for this disease. There are no varieties that have resistance or tolerance uh, as that we know of right now. Um, so you just have to be very careful of the, of the uh, nurseries where you purchase your varieties. Uh, this is a list of uh, available uh, plants. Um, these, we have them divided up by uh, Alabama producers as well as out-of-state producers. Uh, you, if you're interested, just contact me uh, or someone in Extension and we can provide this list for you uh, if, if you wish. And just some resources here. We have Weir, Alabama is a part of the Southern Region Small Fruit Consortium, along with some other, um, other states. Uh, this is a very good organization. It can provide all sorts of resources, um, training, uh, availability, but, uh, and also along with that, we have the Farming Basics online course, along with the Farming Basics app. So this is the end of my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, we can answer, address some of them now. And if you, if you think of anything, or if you would like more information about uh, the uh, plant sources, then uh, feel free to contact me at this information right here. Thank you, and that's all I have.